you. Seventh uh, workshop, and I'm going to uh, quickly uh, turn it over to the city manager for some questions and prior council meeting uh, comments or anything else that you would like to speak of or to, Mr. Manager. So Thank let's you. get started. Thank you, Mayor, County Council members. Uh, at the prior workshop, we had a presentation about the Union Pacific Railroad proposals in the city. You might know that last week this went before the PNZ Commission. PNZ Commission voted to deny the request for closing different streets, and as a result, uh, we've gone back and started thinking about what can we do to make the proposal better? Uh, how do we address those concerns in the neighborhood? So, so rather than trying to go through that same information again, I, I think it's a little bit about going back to the drawing board. Uh, the PNZ recommendation, if I understand uh, Phil or Mike in the audience that will probably go before the council come to you at your, one of your next meetings in January uh, For a receive file and refer action at that time So my suggestion to you is that we have to um, sort of call a time out a little bit keep the process going But I think it's incumbent upon us to go back and relook at it uh, Mr. Mahaffey and I talked about it a little bit skip and I have talked about it as well And I think there's some issues that we need to address uh, more effectively if the, if the proposal has any chance of succeeding. So I'd like, I'd like to be able to do that uh, and come back to you and maybe give you some additional thoughts about it. So it's coming to the council first? Well, the, the, the normal routine process is for the PNZ recommendation to come to you and then you typically refer it on or figure out what Correct. you're going to do with it. Uh, I think that, that should happen. That's okay. the normal course. But what we're going to do between now and then is start to look at some other alternatives and ideas and see how we can mitigate those effects. So okay. that would be my suggestion to you on it, Mr. Mayor, council members. All right. If there, is there anything else, Mr. Manager? Uh, no, thank you. All right. Let's move on to the auditor's report on the 2012 audit. Good morning, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Scott Sanders, Finance Director. I have with me this morning uh, Heidi uh, Hobkirk from McGladry. Uh, she is the lead uh, auditor in working with the city on our annual audits. So she had the responsibility of leading her team uh, through this year's process. This was the uh, June 30, 2012 audit. We have that in print form. And we put a couple copies behind in the, uh, the council chambers behind. Uh, city clerk has uh, copies, and we do have additional copies if any of you individually would like to have uh, the 2012 audit as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to let her, this is really her presentation. Uh, I'll stick around for questions as well after her presentation. So this is Heidi. Good morning. I'm mainly going to go through this handout that I sent. It's a summarization of this year's audit. Uh, the agenda is I'm going to do some auditor communications, some requirements that we have as auditors to you as city council, then some summarized June 30th, 2012 financial information, and briefly hit on the single audit or your federal programs uh, audit that we conduct. The auditor communication with U.S. city officials is in this stapled packet um, that you should have received a copy of or that is available to you. I'm going to briefly go over a few things in there, but there is more information in there if you'd like to look at it closer. The first thing is to let you know our responsibility as your auditors, and, and that is to conduct an audit of the city under three sets of the standards. The first one is the generally accepted accounting standards, which tells you whether your financial statements are materially correct or not. The second set is the governmental auditing standards where we look at your internal controls and the processes in place. 
And the last one is the OMB Circular A133, where we perform an audit of your federal programs that you receive or those federal grants that you receive. Under all three sets of standards, you received an unqualified or clean opinion this year, as you have in the past. You did implement new, two new uh, GASB standards. Those are the standards that the city follows in the, in the current year. Neither one of those standards, based on what they were um, formed to do, had an effect on the city as they were around derivatives and other issues that the city doesn't currently have. So you'll see no change in your financial statements due to new standards in the current year. The next thing is to remind you that all financial statements have manager uh, judgments and accounting estimates included in them. And as your auditors, we do review those judgments and estimates that management does. Uh, they, again, are listed in this packet on page three and four in more detail. Uh, but some examples are your allowance for doubtful accounts on receivables your other post-employment benefit assumptions that are used to calculate that liability, uh, legal contingencies, depreciation on your capital assets, and liabilities in regards to your health uh, insurance, now that you're self-insured, that's a new one this year, your workers' comp, and some other risk management areas. We reviewed all of those estimates and judgments, and we were in concurrence <laughs> with management and believed that those estimates were reasonable for the city. Uh, the next few items are none, so I'm not going to cover those, but there was a couple significant, we call them issues, they weren't really issues, there were some uh, unique things that the city had going on this year that we did discuss with management. The first thing was the formation of the Des Moines Airport Authority and how that affected the city's financial statements and the accounting transactions that the finance department did need to do and changes to the report because of the formation of that airport authority. We'll talk a little bit more in detail later when we look at the airport fund, but you only have activity for four months in the enterprise fund, and then it moved over to the airport authority, uh, which at that point it became a discreetly presented component unit and is shown on your government-wide statements as a separate column. It's not commingled with the city, but because of the connection uh, due to the state statutes and some other things in place, they're, they're just they're a discreetly presented component unit to you. So their financial information is included in the city's financial report, but as a separate column and never commingled with the city information. The other area was the franchise fee class action lawsuit. We did discuss with management the accounting transactions and disclosures that were needed around that also. Any questions over the auditor communications? If not, we'll move to the next slide. And that's the revenues. This is for all your governmental funds. Uh, just a couple areas I'm going to hit on is you did see an increase in your property tax revenues. And that was due to a uh, rollback that happens at the state level that affects the property values. And due to those values increasing, you saw increased property revenues. Your franchise fee taxes were uh, down about 9% or $1.1 million in the current year. You did see about an 88% increase or a $2.4 million increase in your uh, license and permits, and that's related to the traffic cameras that were put into place in uh, fiscal year 2012. You'll also see uh, an increase in miscellaneous revenue of about $4.9 million. The majority of that is due to the termination payment of a lease out at the airport that the re city received some of that termination payment. Uh, related to the lease and the airport received some of that. So that was a one-time increase in miscellaneous revenues that you'll see. Uh, the last category is intergovernmental revenues. And this includes uh, mainly federal and state grants. But in the current year with the establishment of the airport authority, there were some revenue bonds that were still in the city's name that the airport authority is responsible for. But under accounting rules, the city still has to account for those revenue bonds. And with the airport fund uh, basically being dissolved as an enterprise fund, those revenue bonds moved to the government side. So you'll see an increase uh, in intergovernmental revenues of the airport essentially paying you the amount of the principal and interest payments on those revenue bonds. On the next slide, you'll see an increase in debt service also on the expenditure side, which net to zero of then the city paying on those revenue bonds. You'll continue to see um, that transaction happening until those bonds are paid off. And again, these are only the revenue bonds that were in the name of the city that were issued a few years ago um, as part of the airport enterprise fund. 
Overall, the revenues did see an increase of 5% or about $14.3 million. Any questions on revenues? <coughs> if not, the next slide is your expenditures by function. Again, this is just for your governmental funds. And you saw an overall increase of about 7% or $24.4 million in the current year. Uh, I'll draw your attention to the last column, the debt service. And again, that increase is due to that offset of that revenue that I just discussed with the revenue bonds. Um, and that accounted for the majority of the increase and then it was offset by some normal debt service payments that did decrease for the city compared to last year. Uh, public safety did increase about $6.9 million, mainly due to revenue contributions going up, or I'm sorry, retirement contributions going up in the current year, just over $2 million, and worker comp claims were also um, increased in the current year, along with normal salary increases due to union agreements. Health, health and social services did decrease about $4.4 million. Uh, two things there caused that decrease. In the prior year, you held a grocery store, which was in the process of being sold. So the under accounting standards, you have to look at the value of that building, uh, knowing what the market value was, and there was a, a one-year write-down. Um, so when you sold the building this year, there was a small gain. Uh, so you took most of the write-down last year, or the loss last year. And the other part of that is your neighborhood stabilization program had a construction project going on. With the majority of the construction happening in 2011, it wrapped up in 2012, and that accounted for about $2.5 million of the decrease also. What was the construction project? Do we know? Do you know the detail of that? I know it was the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. I'm not sure what specific project or projects okay. it was. Um, community development did decrease about $3.2 million, and this was due to the demolition of the WYMCA building in the current year, along with increased <coughs> TIF payments to developers because those uh, tax increment finance areas saw an increase of property revenues. Uh, so that was available to pay the developers with the contracts you have in place. Any questions on the expenditures? What, what is included in general government? It's a generic answer, but basically any other, uh, it's the function. So it would be any function that did not fall into public safety, which is mainly going to be your police and fire, your public works, your health, social, and health, social services, culture and recreation, community development. Um, so anything that don't, doesn't fall into those type of functions is going to be your general government. So it'll be... Um, city manager's office. City manager's, okay. more of your general administration areas. Mayor and council. Yes, finance okay. department, human resources. Okay. Any other questions? The next slide is just your general fund. We're looking at your fund balance that's unrestricted in days. You'll see that you did increase to about 40 days in the current year from 37 in the prior year. Uh, what this is showing that if no other revenue sources would come in on June 30th, you would be able to sustain the general fund for about 40 <laughs> days with the reserves you have in place. Uh, the Government Financial Officers Association uh, does give a benchmark of about 60 days, but they also put a little asterisk next to it to say you also need to consider your inflows of revenues because other, every governmental entity has different flows of revenue, and so you need to consider those flows of revenue. You have peaks at certain time of year with your property taxes, um, and that's outside of your June 30th year end. Uh, but this is just a snapshot in time. This is just as of June 30th. The next slide is your operating income or loss, um, excluding the depreciation expense, which is more of a non-cash item for your enterprise funds. And each column represents a different enterprise fund. A uh, couple things to note here. The first um, column, which is the airport, this is just four months of activity. Uh, this was the first four months of fiscal year 2012 before the airport authority was established and the operations moved over there. So this is just the operations of the airport. As of June 30th, 2012, all of the, inf all the financial information uh, was moved over to the authority except for the land and the revenue bonds that I discussed earlier. So next year there will be no airport enterprise funds because of that activity moving to the authority. 
All of your um, enterprise funds uh, were able to self-support themselves using operation uh, income and offsetting the re expenditures, except for the municipal housing. Um, the municipal housing has uh, mainly operating grants that they receive of $21.8 million, along with charges for services of about $1.3 million to cover their operating expenses. In the current year, their expenses were about $1.8 million more. They do have um, net assets. The housing fund has net assets of about $23.9 million as of year end that is able to be used um, to cover those shortfalls. Any questions on your enterprise funds? If not, the last thing I wanted to touch on is your single audit. I do not have a slide on that, but we did test seven of your federal programs in the current year. And of those seven programs, we only had one compliance finding, and that was in regards to supporting housing. And in that case, there was some subrecipient information that was required to be reported uh, that was not done uh, in the current year. Uh, we discussed it with the department, and they're going to move forward and make sure that they um, submit that required information uh, going forward and for the past uh, subrecipients that they were required to do. There is more detail in the bound report on that finding if you'd like to look at it um, on page 221. There were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies um, in the single audit nor over the financial reporting. So the uh, compliance finding over the program was the only finding that you had in the current year. There are some required state re uh, findings that we have to include in the report as required under the state of Iowa, and those are in detail in the back of the report also. That's all I have for our presentation today. I would open it up for any questions that I didn't cover. Can you talk a little bit about internal controls as it relates to cash and, and what amount of work the firm does to ensure that we have proper procedures and Sure. Uh, we look, we first gain an understanding uh, of the process of cash receding, uh, not only in the finance area and with the treasurer, but also in significant areas within the city. So if there's departments out there that um, take in a significant amount of cash, we'd also look at those. Uh, we gain that understanding by talking to various people. We don't just talk to one person. We talk to well, maybe one person to get the overall, this is what the process is. But then we talk to the individuals also that are doing those procedures to make sure that what the department head maybe understands is being done is really being done. Um, sometimes in entities you'll find that a, a nice system is set up, but someone has decided not to do something. That was not the case here. Um, so we talk to various individuals involved in the process, and then we also do a sample of transactions and walk it through the key controls that we identify through that understanding and make sure that those are happening uh, for that sample that we conduct. And if we would find any of that, it would, um, depending on the level of the deficiency, under accounting standards, there's various levels, the material weakness being the worst, um, significant deficiency, and then a control deficiency. If we would find any issues, we would report those, either as a finding or a control deficiency in the management letter, um, which there were no concerns or issues that were found either through the understanding or through the testing. Also, as part of our understanding, not only do we look at who's doing what, but also their access. Uh, so sometimes individuals might have access to areas that uh, maybe would leave a hole in the system. We look at that access to make sure that that's not there. Not only does person A, B, and C do certain duties, but what access do they have in the system or to cash um, to ensure they don't have more access than necessary also. With the amount of cash that we have in the system, um, do you feel that there's a need to look at doing um, surprise audits on a periodic basis? That's always a good thing, I would say, um, especially outside of the normal um, process when you have departments collecting cash. I think it's always a good idea from an auditor's perspective to do those surprises. Uh, another part of the audit is we do talk to various people, um, the mayor, management, 
um, and other department heads and people outside of the finance department to ask for areas of concern. So we might rotate through different departments too, depending on what we're hearing or what we're seeing um, in just the general finance <coughs> area, not only here at the city of Des Moines, but throughout the state of Iowa and other states. Um, so that might be part of our procedures, but it may not be. So it is always a good idea internally to be looking at that also. Okay. But there's a cost benefit to that too. Sure. So. If I could just add quickly that with our new ERP system, the software handling of finances, uh, we've dug deeper into the processes of, of handling cash. And because that will be uh, implemented this spring, the thought is uh, we would involve the auditors in the 2013 audit uh, more closely with what those new procedures are and what the new software uh, looks like as well. Okay, so great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Scott, do we do any internal uh, surprise counts or anything of that nature from the internal aspect of the city? Yeah, absolutely. And you can imagine it's similar to auditing in that if you find something that's, that's off and not working, then you dig deeper. And so, and, and that's a very rare case that we, we find instances. Thank you. Skip. Heidi, do you take a look at uh, how we inventory our materials and uh, equipment? Uh, we look at anything that is what we call capital assets in the accounting world. So anything over the 5,000 threshold, we do some testing around that. Um, we did not do significant amount of testing over any other types of inventories in the current year. If it is an area of concern, I can make a note of it and we can, you know, build some procedures around that next year or in the future. But we look at materiality and, and significance under the auditing standard that kind of provides us the guidelines and in the current year there weren't any concerns in those Would areas. you recommend surprise audits for inventory then? If you have significant amounts of inventory or inventory that's maybe easy to walk off with, um, surprise of, of those areas is always a good thing. It also depends on your inventory cycles. I'd have to lean on Scott a little bit more, and, and that might even is, and it might even be more department by department that a lot of times governments don't even maintain an inventory because you're allowed under the different accounting standards to not inventory it and track it on your balance sheet. So it might be something more at the department level that's done. Thank you. Anything else? Allie, anything? Uh, Mr. Coleman? I might be able to go to the longer report. You said it was on page 221, I think, but we had this at our desk here. That's just the required communication to you as the council, so it's things as auditors were required to communicate to you. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm actually in, in the, the last under a category titled significant written communication between management and our firm. Yes. Is a letter from the officers of the housing agency is what it looks like to you. But it looks it's like seven pages long. It looks to me like it's a rare, you know, fairly, you know, built off a template of why, why did you consider that significant? Uh, the housing department uh, issues a separate standalone financial statement. So not only do you have uh, what we call the, the CAFR of the city, but there's also a standalone report for the housing fund because of the HUD filing of REAC that they're required to do. Um, and they have to submit a financial statement with that. So there is a separate standalone fund financial statement. Um, so part of that, because there's a separate financial statement, uh, what you're looking at is what we call a representation letter, okay. and they're representing certain things to us. But that doesn't have anything to do with the compliance documentation no. issue? No, no. Okay, thank you. One other question, uh, <coughs> just in terms of back to the cash. Are you seeing over time that we're actually handling more or less cash? Physical cash, Physical um, cash. my God, not, we don't really look at anything, but my God is that you're handling less um, because a lot of your large dollars are going to come in through wires with your federal grants, your state grants, your property tax revenues, any of your uh, tax revenues coming from the state. All of that is really uh, wired. So that's your dollar wise, that's going to be the largest part of your money coming in. Um, when it comes to citizens, I don't know if you do any studies there. Uh, I, I can get specifics with you, but I, I would also indicate that the Parks Department is moving to uh, registrations that are going to allow for online payments. So you're going to see more in 13 in the current year uh, shift over to non-cash uh, credit type payments. 
So it, right. it's clear that the trend is moving away from, from cash payments. We're trying to give as many options for uh, e-payments and, and that. Credit cards and everything else. Yeah. Even the WALA, or, or I believe, is one of the services that we're, we're looking into at the banking side as well. Okay. Right, Mr. Manager, you have any comments? Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, th thanks for the opportunity. This this is uh, always an interesting time of the year for us, and audit reports for management is always a, a key marker in the year. Uh, we have, um, by any measure, a relatively complex financial system with many revenues and many expenses, and this is not the first year that we've gotten a, a good audit report. It seems like the only time you hear about audit reports are when they're bad. Yes. And you get it on the front page of the paper. We've had we've had uh, really good luck with that. And I did want to just simply say that a lot of that good work and the good reports here and the good results is attributable to uh, our finance staff, Scott and Dan and others in his department, but also to the operating departments. Uh, I think particularly of our engineering staff that gets so many federal dollars that comes in, and the accounting for those dollars is not an easy task. And there's so much of it that comes in with so many regulations. So. Uh, it is quite an accomplishment. It won't make the front page of the paper. Uh, it won't get a whole lot of notoriety, but it is it is very significant. And by the way, your questions this morning, all of your questions and comments were very appropriate. I appreciate them. I know Scott and the staff do. And uh, we are going to be continue to be as diligent as we can on all matters related to financial management. It's a very good result. I'm very pleased with it. There's always, always room for improvement. We'll always look for that as well. Thanks for the chance to say that. You bet. Thank you very much, Heidi. I'd like um, to thank you for having me this morning, but also to thank all of the city staff, um, Scott's department, and everybody else throughout the city that helps us with the audit. We couldn't do it with all of their help. We do ask for a lot of information for them to pull and ask a lot of questions. So without their support, we wouldn't be able to conduct the audit for you. So we appreciate all the help we get from the city staff, too. Thank, thank you. you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you all. Let's move on uh, then to the CDBGDR, a housing application evaluation process. Scott had one more. Scott, you had something? Just a status report. Uh, if I could spend two minutes with you with the handout. Okay. I can do it at the end or now. Well, you want to do it right now? Do it if, it's, if that's okay. All right. It is Everybody but hold on one minute. Scott's going to have a little two-minute presentation here. This is a status report that I just gave you. Here. This is simply a status report on the budget cuts uh, that were adopted in the last cycle. Um, and so this is the handout in color that was given to you and the status of that. And I just give a quick couple notes here to explain what this report looks like and what we've included in it. Uh, very briefly, uh, this is just five slides real quick. The uh, guiding principles that the council went through was to achieve a two-year balanced budget. So that was fiscal years 13 that we're in now, as well as fiscal year 14. That was the $7.2 million bogey uh, that we addressed. Uh, we received public input through the town hall meetings, as well as through uh, the website uh, which was very critical to understand uh, where the preferences were of the public. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of communications with the council at workshops and one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the departments had targets at the beginning of that cycle that were uh, more than what was necessary as a flat percentage. Clearly, there was a desire to minimize the impact on public safety such that the uh, not all departments had the same percentage of cut. That would have been oversimplifying the whole process. <clears throat> the exercise that each department went through was to identify potential cuts that could be managed. Uh, the, uh, e each cut uh, had to identify any service level impacts. And again, we had this above the line that were acceptable and below the line uh, cuts that were offered and deemed unacceptable uh, due to the service level impacts uh, being too negative. And so each department went through that. You may remember there were presentations where we showed each department uh, the cuts identified either above or below the line. So essentially, the uh, adopted budget took the cuts that were above the line. Uh, we ended up with $4.3 million uh, citywide uh, operations cost or, uh, cuts. Uh, each department is shown there. 
And then the uh, handout uh, indicates department by department the individual cuts that add up to these, these uh, totals here. Uh, within that document, uh, we've, we've simply put in the column to the right a green dot indicating that that one has been fully implemented. Uh, if it has not, uh, we indicate if it's still planned to occur in fiscal year 14. Some of these cuts were intended uh, to occur only in the second year of the, of the budget plan, uh, including a couple in the finance department for which we had uh, retirements uh, that, were, that were coming up. So we still have about five items on the list uh, that are intended to be implemented over the next few months. Um, only one item uh, was unable to be achieved, and it was a $13,000 uh, smaller item uh, that we were hoping to be able to find some savings, and that did not occur. So really, of the $4.3 million, uh, we are pretty far along. Uh, it's, it's a continuing process as far as what the service level impacts have been. Uh, each department is still uh, you know, evaluating uh, the cuts that, that have been made to make sure that they're still manageable and minimizing, again, the, the service level to the, uh, the general public. Um, information continues to flow back and forth between the budget and the individual departments. And uh, uh, we continue to look for new solutions uh, in addition to what was already made. So as a recap, the 4.3 million in cuts, 3.9 million of that has already been implemented. You'll also see that as a summary in the very last page of the uh, itemized report, the 3.9 million implemented, which is 92% uh, of what was intended. And we have, uh, like I said, four others that will occur in the next few months. There's less than 400,000 of that to, uh, to continue implementing. And it indicates here the 42 uh, FTEs that, uh, that were impacted by those adopted budget cuts. So that was my quick recap. Uh, we can provide this document as it becomes fully implemented, but this is just an opportunity for you to see that the departments are, have followed through uh, with what was adopted and will continue to monitor service levels. Christine? Scott, Scott, could you give us, um, or get to us, I've got a neighborhood meeting and I'd like to use a schedule that talked about um, the uh, cuts by department. If you could show the percentage. I mean, some of those look very big, mm -hmm. but if I could have the percentage on that one schedule? By percent of what the total uh, yeah. department's budget no, is. So the reductions by department, if we could just have a column that would have the percentage of what their budget was. Because I know if you look, if I were a citizen looking at that, I'd say, wow, Parks and Rec had $802,000 worth of cuts. But percentage wise, is it comparable to the rest of the departments? And that's where you'll see that public safety was held. Right, percent. yeah. OK. Thank you. And then I'll get your answer from earlier on the auditing question. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Now let's move on the CDBG DR, a housing application evaluation process. Matt? Good morning. Matt Anderson, Assistant City Manager. I'm the reason you had to get up and come here a half hour early today because this was the uh, the item that we wanted to get before you kind of in a in a quick time frame to give the developers a chance to uh, to have some time to get their packages together and get to us so we could meet the state's guidelines. So I'm going to run through for you real quick um, what the CDBG DR program is, um, what it's for, and then what our role is in it and how we're going to how staff is working to working with the developers to put together the packages and the scoring system to make an ultimate recommendation to you to um, forward on to the state. So what is the CDBG DR? Um, we've done this before in, in an earlier, earlier round, um, but it, it's back with a second round of funding. Um, this is federal funds administered by the state um, to assist with housing replacement related to the 2008 flood. Um, the funds, like I said, the funds are administered by the state and there are $18 million available to cities, <coughs> flood-impacted cities of 50,000 or greater. Um, cities may submit up to two project, projects. We're pretty well certain we'll get one project in the city of Des Moines with the hope of getting two. It depends on what other cities submit. And the allocation per project is $3 million. 
So in previous rounds, if you'll recall, um, projects that were assisted were um, the Franklin Avenue Senior Project, uh, the Des Moines Building, um, the uh, Green Foundry, Yonkers. So project eligibility, these are some rules that are, that are set out um, by the state. These are not, these are not our rules. Um, it's new construction and multifamily only, not a rehab of existing units. So the goal is they want to bring new units into a community, not just make existing units better. So it's, it's going for the, a greater quantity of units. Um, adaptive reuse and mixed use are eligible. So adaptive reuse being warehouse buildings downtown or office buildings that get converted, that's, that's an eligible, eligible use. And then so are mixed use projects. Um, project utilizing low-income housing tax credits are not eligible. And since we already went through the low-income housing tax credit round, um, th that sequencing is fine. There's no, there's no projects that we're planning to, to kind of double layer, to layer this funding source with that also. So this won't impact any of the uh, tax credit projects that already have their applications in. Um, this is an important point. The state has stressed shovel readiness. Um, in the last round, the cities and developers weren't given a lot of time to prepare for this. It was, here's the funding, get the projects into us, and hurry up, let's go. Um, as the state is stressing shovel readiness this round, we're going to take a hard look at that. That means a couple things. It means both physical construction readiness, meaning zoning um, and uh, um, uh, na neighborhood review and uh, site, site control. And then it also means um, financial readiness. It, does the developer have the track record and the banking relationships and the tax credit uh, equity partner relationships and commitments from those parties to make this a shovel-ready project? So I'm going to talk about shovel readiness a few times as I, as I go through here, and both in from a threshold standpoint and then also a, a more uh, scoring standpoint. Um, who are the people that will live in these units? What, what are the income restrictions? Um, the, the guidelines that are given by the state, by the feds in the state, are that 51% of the units will be occupied, at least 51% of the units will be occupied <clears throat> by households with a, uh, a me, an income 80, of 80% or less of the area median. So flip side, that means that up to 49% of the project could be market rate. Is there higher scoring if it's a higher percentage market rate? Did we put that in the mail? No, no, but we could. That's 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 what we're here to talk to you about today. This is okay. what we're going to talk about today is the the staff scoring that we've set out for this process and give you the opportunity if you want us to go back and tweak something, we absolutely can. Okay. So, um, what does that mean? Median income in Des Moines for a family of four is uh, just under seventy-one thousand. So how does this relate to different household sizes? So that's a, a one-person household of around 40. And then you can see as you add a person to the household, it goes up about 6,000 each person that you add. So these are the, these are, this is the target market for this program for the 80% units. Then again, you could also have um, approximately half the project be market rate. Really, at 80% versus the, what we're used to with the low-income housing tax credit projects that are at 60%, the rents here are going to be pretty close to market rate anyway. There's not going to be a lot of difference in rental rental rate structure that we'll see in the in the 80% units versus the market units. That's one thing that we see a lot where our tax credit projects or our, where our excuse me, where our market rate projects end up with these financial gaps. There's not a huge spread between the 60% rents and the market rate rents in Des Moines as you might see in some bigger markets. And when you get to the 80% level, that spread is is pretty thin. So what's our role? Why are, why are we involved? It's federal money, it's administered by the state. What, what, do, what does the state want us to do? Um, we will actually submit the projects on behalf of the developer. Um, so we'll, we'll put the package together and we'll, we'll physically take it to the developer and there will be a certification given by it's either the city manager or the mayor after you, you've selected the projects that, you, uh, that you, uh, we score. The city receives a 2% admin fee, so that's $60,000 on the $3 million allocation. This involves all the paperwork we're going to do, contract monitoring, Davis-Bacon wage monitoring during construction, and any long-term monitoring to make sure that the 
um, income levels are hit. And from a process standpoint, while well, a project under construct is under construction and construction draws are coming through, the city advances the funds and then is reimbursed by the state. So the city's selection process. How are, how are we going to go about it this time? In the last round, we didn't really have a selection process. It was kind of a free-for-all. We got a lot of money, a lot of projects, and a short time frame to do them. And we submitted the projects up to the state. We want to be a little more thoughtful this round. We know we're, we know we're, we're going to get a maximum of two projects. So how do, we, how do we get the most, how do we bring that federal money into the city and get the most bang for our buck out of it? Um, so we put together a um, scoring criteria to help guide you. We want your input today. We can go back and tweak this in any way you'd like us to. We have both some threshold items that we feel are imperative to even, to even get into the scoring round. So we'll, we'll talk about those first. Um, first one is that we, we are going to ask the developers to meet and notify and meet uh, the neighborhood organization that, that their project is in. We're not, at, for a threshold item, we're not requiring neighborhood approval. Um, it's a short time frame. A lot of the developers won't have their complete drawings done, um, may not be quite enough information to get a neighborhood approval on something, but we want that neighborhood meeting and we'll give extra points in the scoring round for, um, for actual approval from a neighborhood. <coughs> Zoning has to be in place. This is one of a few shovel-ready threshold items that I'll touch on here. But zoning must be in place because we know that's not that a, a project could get its zoning, but it may, it's going to take a few months. Zoning is a step-by-step a, 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 a -step process of neighborhood meetings and, and public council meetings and P&Z meetings. And we just know that take, we know how long that time frame takes and, and staff time. That um, with the time frame you're going to see that we're under, it'd be really tough for a project to come in tomorrow and start the rezoning process. And, for you to be able to certify that it's shovel ready by the time we have to submit to the state. Um, the tax structure, this is the issue of condoing a project to receive the residential rollback. We're requiring developers to not do that and um, agree to the multifam the higher multifamily commercial uh, tax structure for, you see on the screen, of 10 years beyond their tax abatement is what we're asking for. Um, leverage. This is kind of a bang for your buck. How do we get as many units into the city to provide that valued housing for the, for the dollar? Instead of, and, and there are some requirements within the state's guidelines that'll, regarding debt service coverage that get us here, but we, we've set a minimum leverage of one to one, which means for $3 million of state money, of CDBGDR money coming in, um, we're looking for a $6 million project. So you'd have three million in CDBG DR, and the other three would be developer equity, uh, first mortgage, or other tax credit equity if it's a store project or something that might be coming in. Um, here's a threshold item, one of those shovel-ready items that the developer must have site control or an option to purchase. We're not going to we're not going to pick a developer who has a speculative site that they might want um, to do something on. So this is one of the one of the shovel-ready threshold items. Um, the state will not allow a project within a 100-year floodplain, so we made that one of our threshold items. Um, no new enterprise zones will be established. We ran into this with the last, with the last um, tax credit round uh, a month or two ago, where we had a bunch of projects come in and not just request, request enterprise zone, but request new zones be created. That's a lot of staff time to do that. We don't have time to, to run that process concurrently and have you be able to certify that it's show already. If that's a funding source that they're counting on in their pro forma, they've got to be in the zone already. And then from a design standpoint, projects must meet our, um, our tax abatement design guidelines. And then the, I, the state has their, um, one of their criteria is that a project must meet the Iowa Green Streets criteria. We've added in, so that's a threshold item for us because we know the state's looking for it. We've also added um, a competitive scoring criteria for uh, any projects that are LEED certified, beyond, so going beyond the Green Streets criteria. So this is where we're asking for some of your assistance and your input on the um, scoring criteria. So we've laid out a 100-point system um, 
most uh, uh, trying to get a, some objectivity to this. We've talked about some of the site control and zoning and, and enterprise zone being um, more site related uh, shovel ready issues or points or threshold item. For a point system, we set up for, to address the shovel readiness, um, we set financial criteria that the developer has the financial relations to have a shovel ready project and the financial strength to have a shovel ready project. Developer qualifications, have they done whatever type of project they're proposing, have they done a project of that magnitude, of that scope? You know, if they're proposing an historic tax credit or an, an, an historic project or a, an adaptive reuse, have they done an adaptive reuse before? Do they, do they and their architect and their builder know what they're getting into if they're going to go rehab an old warehouse or an old office building? So we're looking for a developer that can deliver the project and has the management skills to do it. Are you talking um, about somebody that's actually done it or their team is able to do we'll that? We'll look at the whole team. We'll look at the strength of the team. Um, there's, I'll be, there's some subjectivity that we're allowed in the scoring of this, um, but we're going to look. They're going to get more points. If it's a, if it's a developer, it's, let's use the historic adaptive reuse project. If the developer has a track record of it and their architect has a track record of it, and they're bringing in a, a general contractor that's done historic renovations. We're going to we're going to look more favorably on that, whether or if it's a developer who's used to doing greenfield sites and an architect who doesn't hasn't done a lot of projects of adaptive reuse. Um, we're not going to score that as highly. We're, we're looking for a team that has the ability to deliver it. Any project we recommend, we're going to recommend our top two projects to you. Any project that we recommend to you is going to be shovel ready. So the key is how can we get, we want to, staff wants to recommend to you the best shovel ready projects that we think are in the mix. And so bringing the strongest development team possible to you is one of those, one of those uh, scoring mechanism, mechanisms that we think is important. And part of, I'm going down to the next one, another part of bringing that best shovel ready project to you is getting some leverage, getting, getting projects that um, have some, some scale, some scope to them that you're bringing that $3 million of money into the community and trying to get some, some impact out of it. So we're looking for larger units, or excuse me, larger projects. Um, and then on the next one, we're looking for unique projects. Um, based, we, we're looking for mixed use projects, projects with neighborhood support, um, mixed income projects, and then LEED certified. So we added some of those layering of what makes what do we feel makes a strong project and that's in the unique market and location items and then finally what's going to set one project apart from another and it's it's hard to put an empirical value on it we've we've tried to do it here but allowing projects for allowing points for a and I'm an, the first one is a stalled project. So I'm going to use Yonkers as an example. Well, that was one of those projects that we were working on for years and years and years, and you just needed someone to push it over the goal line. Well, that's the type of stalled project that everybody wants to see happen, and boy, here's a funding source that we can finally get it done. So a few extra points for that. Um, something that's a, a catalyst of, for renovation. It's, it's something that maybe, you know, you've kind of got that, that, um, that hole in the middle of a neighborhood um, that is holding every th development back, and if we can we can get something going on it, um, an example of this might be like the the Randolph Hotel. Um, I don't think it's coming in for this round, but that's an example of, of we've had three or four different developers look at it over the last seven or eight years. We know it's kind of sitting in the middle of things on Court Avenue. It would be great if it could get rehabbed. It needs an injection. The, you know, extra points for that catalytic impact of revitalization. Um, Looking at support for other planning efforts, this is more neighborhood directed. Our planning staff is doing a lot of work in neighborhoods um, to direct revi revitalization. And if you could bring a signature project in to help uh, help our other ongoing planning uh, planning work, and then you see other other criteria of add solving existing financial, environmental, enforcement problems for the city. If we had a if we had a brownfield site out there somewhere that we were, you know, struggling with what to do, what to do with it, how could we get something going on it? Bring bringing funds in like this to help clean up the site would be it would be a, a great use. And then um, looking at high quality design, where's the where's the wow project that that you drive you want to drive by it when you're done and and say, yep, I'm really glad that project is in the neighborhood. It really looks fantastic. They used the high quality materials. 
went a little bit above and beyond in their architecture and really blended something in with the neighborhood. Um, really looking for the, for the wow factor. I'll come back to this in a minute. Think about it for a second. I want to go through the schedule with you to tell you where we're, where we're headed. So we have about a month, four weeks, and we're asking for developer proposals to be submitted to our uh, to community development by February 4th. This will give us a little time to review, get the blue letter written, get everything in process. And on February 25th, we'll be recommending, we'll show you the whole scoring, but we'll recommend two projects that, that um, we would ask you to review and, um, and, and direct us to send to the state for, for um, final submittal. And then March 1 is the state's deadline for project submittal. <clears throat> And then I've got a line here because there's so this is our process, and I, just to avoid confusion, on the up on an upcoming meeting next Monday, there will be a CDBG DR item on your agenda. The um, Green Foundry Building was unable to get their project um, uh, over the hump, and we we have to cancel the project with the state on that project, and um, and cancel our uh, our our ability to get the admin fee on that project also. So I, I don't want you to get confused when you see a CDBGDR contract on your agenda mon Monday. It's a, it's a separate item from the past. This is, but everything above the line is the timeline that we're working with this time. I'm gonna go back, because this is probably what you wanna talk about. I do. Okay. Um, I, I guess a couple of comments here. Do we have, um, I didn't think I don't think I heard it or I see it there. If there's been a previous allocation um, because a project is phased, how will we handle those? <clears throat> Best example would be um, Ingersoll Square. Okay, yeah, Ingersoll Square. I mean, you know, they're doing it on a, a three-phase basis. They've been awarded already. How? What's the intent? Our intent is to take everything and address it separately. You know, it's it's a, if if they come in with their next phase, we we just consider it a standalone project. Are, are you thinking you is there value in completing a project? Is that is that well? I, I guess m my feeling is um, I think that we need to look at new projects mm -hmm. and that if they've already had an allocation, that they would receive as much um, credit as somebody that's new coming in asking for the first time w would be my sense because I feel they've already been to the been, been to the, been well. the well and um, I don't think that we should allow them to, I mean, if it's a great project and it scores well, fine, but I think that should be when you look at the red, you know, where we were taking away points, I would look at that being a point deduction. I mean, that's just my sense. And I don't know that we have a lot of projects like that. I know we have several. Yeah, we probably, we probably don't. Um, I mean, we've talked, we have a sense of what projects are going to be coming in. How many projects do you think are coming uh, you in? You can look over my shoulder and count the developers and probably guess how many are coming in. Um, okay, you want to raise your hands <laughs> out there? <laughs> we, think, we think there's um, seven or eight that might come okay. in. Um, and some of them probably will be developers that have already received allocations. This is a small town. We have a small development community. And we talked about that. And I've actually talked to some of the developers who have asked, will I be able to get a second allocation if I already got uh, awarded last time? And our first reaction was um, we didn't want to cut anybody out of the process because they might have a great project sitting in the wings that we wouldn't want to just uniformly say no to. But if it's, if it's a smaller part of a scoring system that doesn't just kick them out because they've already received an allocation, that's, that's up to you. But I, I, would, I would recommend kind of looking at it with a clean slate so that you don't ding a project just because somebody was successful before, and not, not I, I don't want to want to want to penalize them for bringing us a good project last time. That was that was our thought process. But we can cer I certainly understand, particularly when it's a phase project and you're just you're you're continuing to put that assistance into one block or one city when it could be spread around more. That there's some. I'm just looking at fairness mm -hmm. from an overall standpoint. I, I guess I would like us okay. to be as fair as possible. They, could you go back to the next slide then where it was the one-to-one -one ratio? Yeah. Um, excess, except in distressed neighborhoods. I'm, I'm pleased with the one-to-one -one ratio, but can you define except in distressed neighborhoods, where those distressed neighborhoods 
would be potentially and also then what would be so we're saying it would not be a one-to-one -one ratio it right and um, we can get you a map of where those neighborhoods would be but an example I'll use would be up in Riverbend okay. where you're probably not going to get a, a big six million dollar seven million dollar fifty seventy five mm -hmm. unit project because it just wouldn't fit in the neighborhood but boy we'd love to have a four million dollar forty thirty unit project up there uh -huh. um, so what we were trying to do is we know that you can't always just take six million dollar projects and plunk them down into a distressed neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's going to be smaller in scope and size. And so, so yes, uh, uh, what we're saying is that we want to allow for smaller a, a smaller project to compete in this scoring system if it's in one of those neighborhoods that really needs a, a shot in the arm. And I don't disagree with that. I think that's fine. But I guess one of the the issues I believe I feel strongly about is the developers need to have skin in the game. Absolutely. If there's no skin in the game, um, you know, I don't care what the ratio is. The, They've got to have skin in the game. And one of the and the, the state um, has set out one of their criteria is regarding debt coverage ratio, and they've required. I'm going to get it wrong. They required a debt coverage ratio within a range. I want to say 1.2 to 1.35 or something like that. Whereas if you had a developer with no with very little skin in the game, that would re, that would result in a debt coverage ratio of two or two and a half or something that was carrying very little debt on it, very little mortgage on it. So um, that'll be one of their there's so there's two checks to make sure there's some skin in the game. Um, that debt coverage ratio requirement and a and this minimum leverage requirement. So we will you won't, you won't, unless it's in, unless it's in one of these distressed neighborhoods where we really want to see an investment, you, you won't see a, um, uh, you won't see a project come in without skin in the game. That's, that was our, that was our goal. We know, we know, we did that on purpose. What, what's the purpose behind the uh, 50 units? The 50 was, um, it was, Brian, it was a number that we kind of pulled out of the air. It was looking, looking for a project that had enough, had some scope and, and size to it. If you figured, if you figured, I'll, I'm going to make my math easy, it's Monday morning. If you figured $100,000 a unit, 50 units, that's a $5 million project. So we figured 50 was probably in that range where you're going to get a 6 to $7 million project. So we, we just wanted to make sure we were getting enough units to, to make a difference in the community. How many, uh, how many of these tax credit projects, did you say two? We'll submit two, yes. We submit two. We'll su we, can, we can only submit two. Okay. I think we'll get one, and we, I'm 99% I'm sure we'll get one allocated by, awarded by the state, and I'm, you know, I'm rel you know, depending on what the other cities do, we could get two. One other question. What's the purpose of the, what's the purpose of the shovel ready, and where did that phrase come from? That came from the state. They, I, don't know the per I don't know the purpose of it. That came from Terry Branstead? That came, that came from the, <laughs> the term IED, shovel ready. IEDA in their document that they sent to us used the term shovel ready. I just, I just want to get that on the record. They, they came from the state. Thanks. Skip. Well, first of all, I think uh, my personal opinion on this is I'm not so sure that uh, the distressed neighborhoods, which are primarily low-income people, need additional low-income people. I don't think that's what they're looking for. I think they're looking for more single-family units, and that's just my opinion. Okay. Um, you also said that uh, you're going to give extra points for neighborhood approval. Where are these extra points at? Neighborhood support here. Unique market. Yeah, under under unique market, neighborhood support is a five point. They, they they only get a maximum of three of the five, so they don't need neighborhood support. They can forego it and still get their 15 points. I think that neighborhood support should be a standalone line all by itself somewhere, and I think it ought to be about 25 points is what it should be, because if you can't get a neighborhood to support it, we've seen what happens when we don't gain neighborhood support. And I think that ought to be pertinent to the developers that they meet with these neighborhoods and gain their support. Well, zoning will already have to already have to be in place, so the land use will already be established on the site. So there there won't be a rezoning going on. So there's no there's no if a project is already zoned, I don't know. It would just be a letter of support 
in our application for, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, but if it's already zoned, asking them to go through a, a neighborhood approval process is an, is an above and beyond, and we can ask for above, well, and, then, above then, and beyond. Then to make a statement that they gain extra points for neighborhood support is not really a good statement, because in most cases they won't need the neighborhood support. They won't, they won't need it for zoning, but we can, we can give them extra points to do that if you'd like. We can, we can stand it alone. Ellie, Bob? Mr. Coleman, anything? <clears throat> Just uh, quickly, I think the I think your uh, numbers are are strong and good. The the one thing that I would probably say is the category that I would like to see um, vetted a little bit more is the bottom one, especially in terms of the kinds of things that um, are very important to the city. They meet our city goals. Uh, it's a project that, that without this might thrust more cost to the taxpayers of Des Moines. I mean, I, I think when the city is given the responsibility to look at these, we ought to make sure that we're using them in a way that benefits our taxpayers first and, and foremost. And, and I know there's 20 points there, but it's, it's unlikely that a single project is going to get each of those kind of different no. varied things. That's kind of a hodgepodge yeah. of, yeah. of things. Um, and the other thing that, that I just, I'll say, because I think it is possible that on the developer qualifications, I hope it's in relationship to the project that they're doing. Absolutely. And, and you might get a very qualified development team, I'm, I'm, I'm hunching here, that could get less points because they have a complicated project than a more rookie team that's doing a more basic project. And I, th those are the kinds of things that I think we, when we do these kinds of point systems, there's always a million arguments with the developers that I should have gotten this and I should have gotten that. How could you give that team more points for qualifications? I, I, I just want to make sure that everybody understands this is in relationship to the project you're trying to pull off. Exactly. Matt, a couple other yes. uh, questions that I have. Following your um, your presentation here, um, one is I noticed in in the uh, developer um, qualifications and also in the uh, the shovel ready piece talks about uh, um, under that one specifically it says if eligible for historic federal and state tax credits. Under what circumstance would you see a historic tax credits come into this, especially given that they have to be new construction? They don't have to be new. They have to be new units. They don't have to be, it does not have to be, it does not have to be new construction. Uh, right there. Adaptive reuse are eligible. Are eligible. New, new, it, so it's an adaptive reuse. Adaptive reuse is, it, so rather than an office, you me, turn it into a yeah. housing, that counts and, okay. Yes. So the exterior of the building is the historic yes. piece. Yeah. Okay. So given that, um, I also noticed that you, um, um, in, in the shovel ready, I got control of the ground. It's zoned properly. I've had my little meeting with the neighborhood. They either do or don't support it, but at least I had my meeting. That still doesn't tell me it's very shovel ready. <laughs> Um, you know, they haven't done any of the other studies that, that one would require. I mean, we looked at the Green Foundry building. I mean, they had to do archaeological uh, digs. I sure. mean, there's lots of other stuff that could put a project like this off six, nine months, 18 <coughs> months while they get these other studies completed, and all of a sudden we're into another round and they haven't broken ground yet. Um, don't you think we ought to be a little tighter on on whatever it is that we decide is shovel ready? Sure, we can we can we can expand the um, the real estate end of the shovel readiness. We could ask that a phase at least a phase one's been approved. If it's going to be downtown, is it going to require archaeological? Most pro there there could be a site if somebody's been working on it for a while that could have their archaeological done, but chances are they haven't. Um, but it's it's possible. We know that we're gonna that you'll run into stuff like that. I know there's at least one developer looking at a um, uh, a site with some environmental contamination on it. 
there has been some work already done, luckily, on that, re on that to know what it is and what it's going to cost and how long it's going to take to remediate, but at least that piece has been investigated. So we can, maybe not in a threshold item, but as part of, some of that almost boils down to that developer qualifications and have they done all that homework on the site to know it. And if they can demonstrate it to us, it's going to show us that they're a stronger, more qualified developer to get a challenging site done. So yeah, we can we can tweak the, we can tweak things to give a developer um, uh, or give a project um, a bump if they've done that work already, as opposed to somebody coming in blind on a site. Well, in just in terms of getting it shovel ready sure. and getting it out of the ground in a uh, fairly expeditious manner, would seem we ought to have something out there that that tells us that they can actually do that. Um, the uh, other piece is, is uh, we went down and you talked about the unique market and location. Uh, I'm somewhat surprised that, uh, as Skip pointed out, the neighborhood support piece. I am somewhat curious about the, the green streets piece. I mean, then come in and pick three out of the five of these. So they let's say they do a mixed use project and it's designated uh, in a or chartered neighborhood and it's a mixed income project, they could forget uh, neighborhood support and, and lead certification. But in the meantime, uh, you know, we're supposed to, um, it, as we directed the city manager in all of our projects, uh, they should have be looking at every aspect that, that makes things green. And I'm somewhat surprised to think that somebody could come in with a lead certified uh, uh, project and they get the same number of points as a person that's willing to go to lead platinum? I mean, what? I don't get that. Okay, so what we can do, and I'm taking notes as we go here, we can pull out lead certification and neighborhood approval, pull them out of those categories, put them in their own separate categories, and give them, um, instead of the here where you get to kind of pick and choose, give them a more hard and firm scoring system, scoring part of the matrix, and then decrease in order, I like a nice round 100 point scale, so we'll decrease the points allowed on a couple of those other things so that we can allocate points directly to neighborhood approval and, um, and uh, lead certification. Now, one thing that'll be challenging on this because this is, com most developers don't, don't plan a project in 30 days, they like to, they spend a long time. It's going to be, they're going to make some, they're going to, we're going to be asking the developers to make some commitments to things like lead certification that their engineers and architects probably haven't had full time to vet and make sure that they've got their lead points. So um, I'm, I'm fine with it, but we'll be putting a little burden on them to be making some promises that they haven't fully vetted yet. But that, I guess, is going to go back to the qualifications of that developer and their development team that they're comfortable with the promises they're making to us because ultimately they are making promises to us. If they promise us that they're going to give us a, a LEED certified building, they're going to have to deliver a LEED certified building and not come back later and say, oh, I didn't know it was going to be so expensive. So we're going to be looking for a developer and, their, and a team that knows what that means and what it entails to get it done. So it, again, it's going to come back to the strength of the developer. But we can do that. Christine, you had something else? Um, no, I think I've got it answered. Thank you. All right. Anybody have anything else for Matt? Skip? Mayor, I think we've got some people in the audience that would like to speak to this instead of waiting till the end of the meeting. I think it would be more appropriate if they approach the podium at this time, if, if the rest of the council agrees. Council? All right. All right. Anybody like to make some comments on this? There's a gentleman here. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, I want to congratulate Matt on putting the first draft together uh, on his team. Uh, first draft is always uh, the hardest and the editing is the easier part, so I, I admire uh, him for doing it. I'd previously given out, uh, I think, most of the council members besides uh, Mr. Coleman uh, this list of a couple of suggestions. Several of these have already been touched on and I appreciate that. Hey, Rich, would you give us your name uh, I'm sorry, name Rich Eichner, 300 Walnut. Um, the, the piece that I think deserves some more credit are, I think what you mentioned, Mr. Mayor, archaeological studies, phase one and two environmental studies, soil engineering reports, 
uh, SHPO sign off on design if needed on historic projects. Um, uh, and if anything, uh, IEDA indication the project is shovel ready. I mean, we've, we've personally met with IEDA and the director uh, and Tim Waddell, and clearly they're very concerned that these projects can, can turn dirt in 90 days, give or take, after approval. So <clears throat> there will not be time to do all those studies if it's, re if it's required. And I think that the financing um, piece uh, point should be reduced and uh, credit for these other items be added uh, to that category. Obviously, financing is very important, but if that's, I mean, 30 points essentially takes the project off the table. Um, but if you have 10 points for financing and you have five points for some of these other things, I think you still get your general criteria and make it shovel ready. I appreciate what uh, uh, was Matt said about uh, the, the development team. I think that's key. Uh, I also agree 50 is a pretty high criteria. Uh, I do think uh, it makes sense to leverage city dollars and state dollars and federal dollars. So I do think it's appropriate to have uh, some kind of criteria that gives more credit for larger projects and more leverage from the city. So I do not dispute that part of it. Uh, it's just what the minimum should be uh, to get started in that process. Uh, and uh, those are my comments. You've gotten the written things, which I say several things have been covered, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. If anybody has a quick question, or I'll let other people speak. Mr. Manager? Rich, just a yes. question for you. Sure. I, I get your point about the archaeological and environmental studies, so that if a developer has done that mm -hmm. uh, in a site where that's required, mm -hmm. that would seem to be relevant to uh, the, the fact that the project is feasible to go. Yeah. But compare that to a project that doesn't have that requirement. In your mind, would you give more points to the project that that had those requirements and done it, and less points to a project that had no requirement for those kinds of things in the first place? How, how would we, are you saying one should be given an advantage over the other in that instance? Uh, obviously, you've got different projects that have different requirements. I'm not sure that any bank financing can be done without a, uh, a phase one, if, if necessary, a phase two environmental, for example. So that may be something that's relevant to every project. Something like archaeological study, you know, that's going to be more individualistically determined. Uh, something uh, in the nature of a, of SHPO re a review of design. Um, uh, as you know, you have one developer suing SHPO right now <laughs> over design criteria. Uh, I mean, if, if that's up in the air, you're not really shovel ready if, you, if you're not ready to, to, to certify that you are going to provide what SHPO requires in the project, or have already met with them and have, 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 have agreed with them on a design criteria. It seems like your point has great validity where those requirements are yes. there and present, but a site if that it, doesn't have absolutely it. Absolutely greenfield then, where there's no historic yeah. credit. Okay. Yeah, it, it's a different that, matter. So. That helps, thanks. Anything else? All right, thank you. Thank Anybody you. else? Anybody else that has in mind coming up, kind of put your hand up here so we can, so we got two left. Okay. I'm Carol Bauer with Hatch Development, 1312 Locust Street. Um, we are working in on the 6th Avenue corridor, and um, the 50 units is a little um, uncomfortable for us because there isn't a site that will accommodate 50 units. We have options on three sites now. Um, to work with the EPA, uh, the DOT, on, and uh, with the City of Des Moines on the 6th Avenue Corridor for Sustainable Communities. And in order to get all the Green Street criteria in, we can't do any more than 30 units on a site because they just aren't large enough. So I would like to ask for consideration of that in the distressed neighborhoods. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Hello, my name is Tim Ritma, uh, 512 and a half East Grand Avenue, Des Moines, Iowa. Um, my only uh, comment on this is uh, I'm working on a project uh, with the city that I've had some uh, financial challenges in, um, and part of the project would require uh, potentially acquiring property, some acqu property from the city of Des Moines. Now, I've kind of learned from the timetable that this would not be able to overlap. If I would do so, because of council, um, you know, city process, it would, I would miss my deadline. So I'm asking um, if we could, the shovel ready part to kind of uh, be a dot or, uh, you know, language to be added that would give, you know, if, if the project was one of two to be chosen, 
um, somehow we could work through that issue. I'm sure it's, it's something simple if, you know, the project I propose is one that we want to move forward with. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank uh, everybody for their input on this matter, and we're going to move forward as it uh, is laid out. It will become coming before the City Council uh, fairly soon. Mr. Manager. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, uh, I've taken some notes here. I know Matt has. Uh, there were several suggestions our intention as staff will to be take all of your input. We'll go back, do our best to revise these and get it back to you. It'll be very soon. It's going to be a fast turnaround because I think we have to get this back out on the street within a matter of hours or days at the minimum. So we'll do our best to revise these to reflect what you've done here. I would only ask that when we get it back to you, if you would take a quick look at it uh, and get back to us if you think we've hit the nail on the head in terms of what you ask us to do here. <clears throat> Matt, anything from your standpoint that you want? Community development staff will try and get it done today. Okay. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to uh, Community Development Towing RFP Review. Mayor, Council, Sue Ann Donovan, Zoning Enforcement Officer, Neighborhood Inspection Administrator. I'm going to go through this really quickly to keep, try and keep us on schedule and have time for questions and answers when we're done. Um, just to give a brief outline of the chain of events that brought us here, um, the last Neighborhood Inspection Division tow contract ended March of 2012. We bid out that new contract May of 2012. Crow Tow actually returned a bid that gave the highest return to the city. Council approved Crow Tow's bid the bid was appealed by SWIFT, and Council then rejected the bids and turned it back over to staff for review. Past contracts um, in 2009 and 2012 were specifically written for towing and storage and disposition of junk vehicles. Staff policy in the past has been to only allow demolition of the towed vehicles. So the May 2012 bid, um, the vendors that were bidding it took different approaches based on their understanding of the Iowa Department of Transportation rules on disposition of vehicles. Um, one or some of them uh, bid based on the current policy of demolition only or the policy in place at that point. Um, and then the successful bidder uh, made his uh, bid um, with the understanding that he was going to get to decide how to dispose of the vehicles. July 9th, council uh, referred this back to the city manager and the legal department to work with the procurement officer on appropriate language for the bid specification. There was direction from council to tighten up the language, eliminate confusion, and have a solid bid proposal out, and encourage the use of pre-bid meetings to address any confusion before the bids were let. Staff, uh, Neighborhood Inspection Division, Legal, um, Finance, um, took a great length of time to look at the state laws, the uh, state administrative rules, the Iowa Department of Transportation policies. Uh, we reviewed the police department tow contract, Polk County tow contract, and we feel we've uh, drafted a clarified and clearly defined bid package at this point. Um, it's sort of a shift in policy at this point. Um, this contract specifically provides that towing um, the vendor, whose successful vendor will get to decide um, how the vehicle to, will be disposed of based on uh, state and DOT rules. Um, they'll have to comply with all those rules. It can be sold for use on the highway, sold for junk and demolished or dismantled and sold for junk. We did, at Council's suggestion, um, hold a pre-bid meeting. Um, the, the bid packages were sent out December 4th. Pre-bid meeting was held December 13th. Uh, four companies uh, showed up and asked for clarification. We took questions at that point. Questions were then reviewed by the Legal Department, Neighborhood Inspection Division, and Finance. And the responses to those questions were sent to everybody at the meeting on December 28th, 2012. 
Next, the bids are due this morning. I apologize, there's a typo. It should be 10.30 a.m. bids are due. Staff will evaluate and determine the successful bid bidder based on the bid package, and then the acceptance of the bid will be presented back to council for approval. <clears throat> we feel that the um, policy shift from the staff de de deciding that they all should be demolished to the vendor deciding it is in compliance with state laws. Um, it shifts some of the balance of the work to the vendor rather than staff, so it saves us time and energy um, internally. Um, we can review this. Um, on If we see problems with it, we can review it at the end of the year. Um, we will be tracking to see if there's any problems with the bid, or if there's a real big problem, we could also um, pull it back on a 30-day notice and rebid it at that point. So there are options for to see how this works over the coming year. Any questions? Do we have criteria in there as to the vendor guide, guidance as to what they can or can't do, or are we just leaving it as an open slate? We, we're leaving it as an open slate based on the DOT rules when we bid it out to a vendor, yes. So we've all received these emails with charges about not being handled appropriately and why, it's, why we're going the direction we are. Do you feel that, that what, what you're recommending here and the process we're going through adequately addresses those? Yes, I do. Okay. Skip. Um, first of all, uh, your chain of events causes me great concern that we're waiting until a contract is up to decide whether we're going to extend that contract or let a new bid. I think we should be doing that a couple months earlier for continuity so when one is up, we're ready to continue. Um, also, just to make it clear, we're not going to be hiring a backyard dismantler by any means. Is this correct? That's correct. They we have to have the state license. They have to have a city salvage license. They have to have a place of operation. So in no way, shape, or form is this going out to somebody who's doing it in their backyard. Uh, there have been questions raised about what do we do with waste oil, fuel, fluids out of these vehicles. Do we oversee and ensure that whoever we hire is complying with all standards on this so that we're not running a risk that they're dumping batteries in a whole lot back or something of that sort? That, that's part of their state recycling license, I believe, and part of our salvage dealer oversight. They have to comply with all state and federal rules and regulations on how they dispose of pieces and parts and vehicles, yes. Okay, thank you. Anybody anything else? Uh, why don't we uh, quickly, unless somebody has anything for uh, um, staff, let's open it up for any discussion or input. I know there are maybe somebody in the audience who would like to give us a little input on this issue. Good morning, Mike Swift, 1720 East Washington. Um, it, the only disagreement I have in the contract is that being a <clears throat> third generation auto recycler, having the same business uh, in the same location since 1963, uh, we feel that these cars should be end of life vehicles, not determined by us to put back on the streets for sale or, or put up for auction. Um, that is our only disagreement with the contract. That's been our only disagreement with the contract that we believe these vehicles should be end of life. <clears throat> um, also, the numbers in the contract um, that staff come up with, with the 850 number, the number's more in the 450, 450 range. And out of the majority of that 450 cars that, that we have received in the last couple of years, I would say 99% of these cars should not be put back on the road or should not be put up for auction. Uh, they should be dismantled by a automotive recycler. And uh, there are certain specifications that we adhere to. Um, you know, not like our forefathers used to dump oil and stuff on the ground. We, we do adhere to not only um, state laws, but also um, with our Iowa Auto Recyclers Eye Care program. Um, like I said, that's what we believe these vehicles should be, end of life. We don't think what we should determine whether these cars should go back on the road at an auction. Um, most of the people at the auction, we're at cars, we're at the, at the at the city auction buying these cars that are, are abandoned vehicles. These vehicles, the majority of them are people are sitting in people's yards that neighbors complain about. 
that are sitting there taking up space that don't have licenses on them. And the majority, like I said, 99.9% .9 of them are cars that should not go back on the road. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Any questions for me? Anybody have anything? Mike, thanks. thank you. Uh, I'll ask if there's anybody in the audience that has any other public comment that they would like to add to the discussion for the good of the order. Seeing none, thank you all for uh, coming, and we'll see you uh, next week for a regular city council meeting.